guy who taught me. A whisper when he went like that. And he said, now you know, and now you don't say. There's a saying in Hebrew that goes like this, Eilish Yodin, Lo Omrim. The Eilish Omrim, Lo Yodin. It means those who know, don't say. And those who say, don't know. Simple. And that's been the point that has kept us all these years. But how can I give to you some proof? Not just my words. Oh sure, you can go and say, look, let me talk to Rabbi so-and-so, let me talk to this one, let me talk to that one, and ask if what I heard from this crazy Rabbi in the desert, if it's true, if he's just talking out of the top of his kippah. His yarmulke. And the answer is, you don't have to run. I'll show you why you're here. Why you're here. Then you can run. At least you'll run with some knowledge. You know, when you're running for the goalpost, it's good to have the football. <laughs> right? What's the point of running for the goalpost if you don't have the football? No score. Okay. Now, if my faithful cameraman will come in on my book, I will hold it up, and I'll show you something. A very kind and wonderful rabbi in Israel. I'm not going to mention his name because he didn't give me permission to give his name on this tape on this videotape. But it's a gift. And I can tell you that the book is a very kosher book. And the book happens to be the prayer book for Rosh Hashanah. We call it, call it the Machzor. And it happens to be in the Nusach, or the tradition of the Ashkenazim. The European Jewry, or Western Jewry. Rather than Eastern Jewry. Although, the same thing appears as well in the Eastern tradition. I just happen to have an Ashkenazi tradition book here. The book, by the way, so that you will know, I'll turn to the first page, so that you can see. It's called Machzor Rabbah, and it's for Rosh Hashanah, and it's Nusach Ashkenaz, and it's printed by what's called Mozart Sfarim Eshkol Yerushalayim, by the publishing house of Eshkol of Jerusalem. And that's the title. Now, there comes a time of during Rosh Hashanah, that we blow the shofar, the ram's horn. Many of you know it, many of you may, be, may even have heard it. I happen to blow it here, and it's something that one will never forget once he experiences that. But during the time of the blowing of the ram's horn, there is a little prayer that we say in between the various sets of soundings. The first set of sounds of the shofar is called Tashrat. In Hebrew we make a combination, it's like NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? Well, here we have Tashrat, which is Tkiyah, Shvarim, Truah, and Tkiyah. And I won't go into all of that, what it means. Enough to say it's called Tashrat. There are very deep meanings behind all those tones, but we won't have the opportunity or the time to go into it now. The prayer that we say between the first set of soundings and the second set of soundings, which you see here, is this prayer, and I'm going to read it to you as I point to it. It says, Yiratzon milpanach, and I'll translate. May it be your desire, your will before you, talking to Hashem, to God. Shetkiyat tashrat, that the blowing, the sounding of tashrat, tokim, that we are blowing, Tehemarukemet will be interwoven Biriyah in the fabric, in the curtains of heaven, if you will. Avidei Avumunei, by the hand of the monitor, by the hand of the one who's in charge, the supervisor. Tartiel, that's the name of one of the angelic uh, supervisors in the heavenly sphere. Kershem, like the name, Shekibalta, which you received, Al Yudei, by the hand of Eliyahu, Elijah, Zikrono Lebracha, Zal, Zikrono Lebracha, of blessed memory. Notice this very clearly and carefully, the Yeshua, and Yeshua. Yeshua. Here is the name that I spoke of. The name which you have received, Yeshua, 
So we give him the title. And right after that, the title is called Sar Hapanim, the prince, the minister of the face, meaning the face of Hashem. In other words, this one called Yeshua is no less given the title of the very reflection of the insides, the Pnim, the insides, the face, Panim, of God. And we utter his name during the first and set, between the first and second set of soundings of the shofar, of the ram's horn. Now let me finish the prayer. The Sar Metatron and also the Minister Metatron, that by the way is sometimes used as a another name for the name Yeshua. It means the guide of the way, Metatron. Utumalayalenu and fill us up, Barachamim, with your mercies. Baruch Atah, blessed are you, Baal Achamim, he who possesses all mercies. Alright. We have now uttered the name during the time of the sounding of the shofar. But we have one final prayer that we must say, which relates to that prayer I've just read to you. And after we have sounded the final set of soundings in this portion of the service, we then refer, we then refer to the final little prayer, and it says this. Uchen, accordingly, may it be your desire before you. This stands for the name of God. We won't say it, we'll say Hashem. Elokeinu, our God. Veloke Avoteinu, and God of our fathers. Shiya'alu Eilu, that these should ascend, which Hamalachim, the messengers, should ascend. Hayotim mina shofar, that have gone out from the shofar. Uminat kia and from the kia, one of the notes we've sounded. Umin hashvarim, also a note. Umin ha a note. Umin ha tashrat, umin tashat, umin tarat, the three soundings, three sets of soundings. Lifnei chisei kodecha, that the name, remember the name that we have called out, that it should go before your throne of glory. Vayamlitu, and that these names should recommend, in the name of Yeshua. Tov, goodness, ba'adenu, in our behalf. Lechaper, in order to atone, al kol hatotenu, in order to atone for all our sins. So the last prayer says that we call upon the name of Yeshua, that it may atone for all our sins. Now I want you to understand very clearly that I did not write this prayer, and I did not publish this book, and I did not write this book. This book was written by rabbis long ago. And this prayer cannot be taken out of this prayer book. Not by me, and not by any other rabbi. Even if a rabbi desired to extract it, he could not. Not if he's an orthodox and observant rabbi who goes by rabbinical halakha. Because he's bound by what we call the word and the prayers of Chazal. Even if a rabbi desired to extract it, he could not. Not if he's an orthodox and observant rabbi who goes by rabbinical halakha. Because he's bound by what we call the word and the prayers of Chazal. Chazal means Chachamenu Zichrono Lebracha, our wise men of blessed memory. And what Chazal has put in, we are of insufficient authority to remove. We must leave it in. And therefore, here it stays. But there's more. And I can show you thousands of places like this. But I'm here only to show you just a few. To prove to you that the name Yeshua is not foreign, but very intimately known. And by the way, why do we expressly say the name at the time of Rosh Hashanah? Because that's when we blow the shofar. And that's when the sound, that's when the sound of the name is not likely to be heard by the nations, by the non-Jewish people who may very well be present. You know, there's an interesting story that I can tell at this point, that we tell of the time of the Spanish Inquisition. There was, at that time, 
a gentleman called Don Aguilar. Don Aguilar. And he was a famous Jewish composer of music and as well as being a composer, he was a conductor. Don Aguilar was what we call a marano. Marano is the Spanish word for pig. And that was the word that they used about Jews who had externally, to save their lives or the lives of their families, converted to Christianity, and yet inwardly and secretly, they maintained a full Jewish life, and they maintained it under threat of death, and a very painful death, a very horrendous death. Well, it came time during the, after the Jews were expelled from Spain, that the Maranos, the Jews who had converted, remained behind, but always under suspicion. And of course, during the time of Rosh Hashanah, the commandment of the Torah is, you must hear the shofar blow. If you don't say a prayer, if you don't do another thing, you must gather yourselves together in a particular place where the shofar is sounded. That's the commandment. And then if you've done that, you have fulfilled the commandment of the Torah. Even if you've done nothing else. And the Jews had to do it and they couldn't do it. Except Don Aguilar decided that he would solve the problem of the Jews. And here's how he did it. On that particular day, the day on which fell Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the festival of the blowing of trumpets, called in the Torah, in the, Torah the Bible, he called a great concert and he invited at that time Queen Isabella, King Ferdinand, that they should all come and the whole royal court and all the Christians, all the court of the church, the whole hierarchy of the church, they should come as well. And that they should hear the concert which was going to be music of all nations. And true enough, on that day, Everyone in the kingdom came, including the Morano Jews. As a matter of fact, the Morano Jews were forced to come. Because it was a great day. It was a day of rejoicing. It was a day of, after all, if any Jew was caught behind, they would suspect him of observing Rosh Hashanah. And so the Morano Jews had to show up. Because then it could, they would prove to the Gentile world that they were no longer observing Jewish customs or laws of the Torah, that forbid, but that, that they were had eschewed all the laws of the Torah and that they were obeying only the Christian laws which was at this particular time come to the concert. And they came. And so did the Christians. And so did the royalty. And Don Aguilar began his concert of the music of all nations. And everyone was thrilled by it as the various musicians stood up and played different compositions all in a medley of a song from all the nations of the world. And finally there was one section in which the musicians stood up and they had a very strange instrument in their hand, known by no one, an instrument which we know as the ram's horn, the shofar. And they lifted up the shofar and they blew tkiya ba all the Jews in the hall knew what was happening. And every heart beat fast. Every ear and every eye watched for and listened for the Mashiach. They knew it, they felt that they could see him coming, they could hear him coming. And not a single Christian knew what was happening. Not a single Christian realized that every Jew in that hall was calling upon the name of Yeshua and not upon the name that they had accepted via the Christians under forced conversion that they were listening to the sound of the shofar and that they were uplifting the, the name of Yeshua which had they been discovered they would have met with a terrible death at the stake. And under Christian noses 
Jewish tradition was upheld. But for this reason we have had to keep it secret. This is our tradition, this is our history, forced upon us, albeit by the Roman exile and by the church which had to come together with the Romans. After all, there was a political detente with the church. It, you couldn't have a history, you couldn't have a religion together with a government. The Roman government, the, the civil Roman government could not join hands with the religious element unless they agreed. You can't have the religion preaching that the Jews are going back to their homeland when you have a political element saying we're going to take them out of their homeland. And so the religious element agreed, yes, we will obey all the laws of the politics and we will say, okay, the Jews, forget about it, they're finished. And that's what is the hallmark of the, Jew, of the, of the Gentile book, which it calls the New Testament. There's no return in it of the Jewish people to their homeland. The message of the prophets is not carried forward. They say the message of the Messiah is carried forward, but it isn't. Because the message of the Messiah is the return. The ingathering of the exiles. It isn't the spiritual one, it's a very physical one. And together with that physical one are tremendously important spiritual overtones and undertones. But there's not a separation. The Messiah does, is not, he's not cooking a barbecue in heaven someplace. He's coming back to this land to govern, to rule. In what we call, in what we call the kingdom of the Mashiach. For a thousand years. That's real. And he's doing it in his day. And this day while I sit in Fortress Israel, I can now speak this without fear. That the Gentiles are going to murder me or my family? I don't have to hide, as Don Aguila made it possible for the Moranos to hide. I don't have to hide anymore. I don't have to fear any longer. I'm home. And if you're Jewish and watching me, please, you, can not, you don't have to fear either. You don't have to kowtow to your Christian neighbor who may become offended when he learns that you know Yeshua better than he does. Because he never knew him in the first place. You can come home and truly see what I see. And I'm going to give you now the next thing, which is what we say on, on Yom Kippur, ten days after Rosh Hashanah. After we have just said the name of Yeshua during the time of the blowing of the shofar, the ram's horn, we then come ten days later to Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, we come to the high point of the service, which is called Musaf, the additional service. And at the Musaf of Yom Kippur, we have another aspect of the service called the Kedusha. And in the Kedusha, we interrupt that holy point, that high point of the service, to say what we call a piyut. A piyut is like a poem. It's really more than a poem, but I don't have a better word for it. And we read these words. Notice. And we read these words. Notice. Pina menu Moshiach Tzidkeinu. Torn away from us is Messiah our righteousness. Someone tore him away from us. Someone ripped him away from us. Pulatsnu ve'ein minu Tzidkeinu. We are in a state of collapse and we have no one to justify us. Avonoteinu ve'ol pshainu omeis. That our transgressions and our crimes are burdened upon him. And he has become desecrated. He, he has become that one that we have seen as Yeshua has become desecrated. From our crimes. He suffers from the shoulders, the brunt of our sins. He finds forgiveness for our transgressions. That we are healed by his wounds, by his stripes. That he is eternally recreated anew. From the circle of the Gentiles, raise him up, cause him to ascend. Let's get him back, let's bring him home. Seir means Mount Seir. By the way, here we're sitting just a few kilometers to the east of us where Mount Seir is. 
Mount Seir is another word for the mountain of Edom. Edom is another word for Rome. Rome is another word for, in Jewish eschatology, for the Christian religion under the Roman kingdom. And it says, from Seir, or from the Christian faith, Hadla'eu, Be'lemal. Be'lemal. And by the way, we have this in our notes, our explanations. I'm not giving you something original. I'm giving you something that has been given to you by the tradition of the a wise men of blessed memory, Chazal, our rabbis before us. La Shmienu Bahar and Lebanon, that we may that he may be heard on the Mount of Lebanon, which is called the Mount uh, the mountain of the Lord's house, and called Lebanon because it was made with the house of Hashem was made by the cedars of Lebanon. Shanit, that we will hear him a second time. By the hand of Yinon, and Yinon is another uh, name that we use in Gematria to stand for the same name that we read during Rosh Hashanah, Yeshua. Yinon is another one of those secret names. So you see, with all that, we talk about the same thing, the Mashiach, who has been forcibly taken away and bound in chains and kept in chains by the non-Jewish world for all these years, while they have upheld, not him, but someone who is not really a defender of Israel, as Moses was to be, and as the one who would be like Moses was to be, but the accuser of Israel. And so we are to rescue him. We Jews are to redeem the Mashiach. Can you imagine that? We Jews have a job of redeeming the Mashiach. Yes. In good Jewish eschatology, in Midrashim, written by our rabbis, we're told that the Mashiach has been sitting in the exile together with us and suffering every death that we have suffered because Isaiah 53 talks about Bimotab in his many deaths. And he has suffered over and over again especially in our generation, six million deaths. And when the Mashiach returns, you can be absolutely sure that when you look into his eyes, that you're going to see six million sets of eyes which have been turned coal black from the gas chambers and the ovens. You're going to see a Messiah who has suffered, my friends, not just suffered from the cross, suffered and continually suffered for 2,000 years in three crusades, because when they locked us in our synagogues to be burned, when 1,000 Jews were locked into a synagogue and the synagogue was set alight, and those on the outside were singing, Glory be to Jesus. Inside, where the Jews were being burnt to death, and where the screams of men, women, and children were coming, in there was Yeshua. In there was Yeshua dying. Believe me, and I ask you straight out, if that scene were once again, and God forbid it should ever be repeated, but we have every reason to think it may be, God forbid, where will you be on the outside singing songs and praise to Jesus because the Jews are burning? Or will you go inside and burn together with the Jewish people and together with the Messiah who is burning with them? Because that's the real Messiah. That's the suffering servant of God. He's the one that suffers, not suffered once, but suffers continually and continually and over and over again until that final moment. And why do you think we've, been half, we've, we've not been able to say these words? Could I speak these words if I were living in the United States of America before a Christian audience? More than likely I'd be stoned. I don't even say more than likely because I was there. I was there about six years ago. I was there in 1985 seven years ago. And I spoke, I was asked to speak at some Christian churches. And when I spoke, I remember specifically saying at one point in my message, I look forward to the day of a message given to me in Yechezkel in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, we call Lamentine, 37th chapter where it says all the bones of the whole house of Israel will come together and we will come up and out of our graves and the whole house of Israel will live again. And I said, and that means six million Jews who suffered at the hands of Hitler and at the hands of that Nazism which grew up in the, in the garden of Martin Luther's Reformation, the garden of Christian Reformation, Hitler who spoke Martin Luther's words to to make, 
to validate his filthy ideas, his third life. This, this, my friends, I was told I had no right to speak. They came to me afterwards and they said to me, you must never again, in all the tour that you're going on, in the five weeks that you're going to be speaking, you must never again say those words that the Jewish people will rise again from the grave and they will include the six million of the Holocaust. And I asked, why not? This is my hope. This is my whole being. In this I live. If I couldn't believe this, if I didn't believe this, I wouldn't be a human being. I wouldn't be a Jew. I wouldn't even want to live. If I had to relegate those six million to a dead, to a, to a grave forever, because the Christians say that they didn't believe in their Jesus Christ, I would want my life to end. And they said, but you see, that's exactly why you must not say it, because the people to whom you're talking believe that those people are eternally there. Not only were they put into the gas chambers just because they were Jews, not only were they taken from their homes and their families, not only were they ripped apart, not only were, they, were the babies thrown live into flames, just because they were Jewish, not because they had sinned, only because they were Jewish. But you see, after that they were burned, and after that they were thrown into mass graves. And after that, we Christians are very sure they're in hell forever. You know, I almost vomited, and I said, but I cannot do that. And they said that we will have to cancel your tour. And I said, if you want me to speak about something else, because I've committed myself to you, I'll speak about something else. And I did. And for the rest of those five weeks, sometimes three, four, and sometimes five times a day, I told jokes. And I could tell a million of them. Oh, Jewish. I told jokes and people were rolling in the aisles. Oh, the wonderful rabbi who could tell jokes. Today I'm not telling jokes. Then I did. Today I'm telling the truth. Today I'm telling the truth. In the diaspora, I cannot tell the truth. I tried. I could not speak of the real Yeshua. I tried. And my forefathers tried. And they before them have tried. And they were told the same thing, and not just in the way I was told. They were told at the point of a sword at their neck, you will not say those things again. Because we don't believe them. So the rabbi spoke to Simcha Perlmutter and said, Young rabbi, you may know the truth, but now is not the time to speak it. When you go back to your land, ah, that's a different story. When the ingathering takes place, ah, that's a different story. I'm running out of time, but I want to show you one more thing. Another book. This very large book that I have here contains many, many words. From the Talmud and from the Holy Books, it's completely a Jewish lexicon. And over here, we have, notice it carefully, Yeshua HaBen. If you see all the columns, this is a Jewish book. There's not a word of English in it, not that I know of. I haven't seen it yet. And the word Yeshua HaBen. Now what is Yeshua HaBen? Notice that's Yeshua, the name of the person, Yeshua. And then HaBen means the son. Yeshua the son. What does it say? I'm going to read it. It's very short. It says, Kidui Latekes, meaning a shortened form or a, a, a nickname of the ceremony, Shel Pidyon Haben, of the redeeming of the firstborn. You see, in Judaism, when a mother gives birth to a first child, and that child is a male, and it passes the womb, that child then, 30 days later, must be redeemed because he doesn't belong neither to the mother nor the father, he belongs to Hashem. 
And he must be redeemed. How do we redeem him? With 30 pieces of shekel, 30 pieces of silver. And who is it paid to? The Kohen, the high priest. And then he's redeemed. And that ceremony, by the way, is called Yeshua Haben. Because we call the ceremony by the same one. In other words, the ceremony, the name of the ceremony, Yeshua Ben, is the very redeeming feature. Yes, we pay the money, but we pay the money ceremonially. But the name of the actual ceremony, and every man will know this, and concede it's the truth, Yeshua Ben. We call it Yeshua Ben because He is the redemption of our firstborn sons. Every firstborn son who is a Jew is redeemed by the name of Yeshua the Son at the 30-day ceremony after his birth. I'll read, I'll finish the, the sentence. Shal pidyon haben habakor haneerah bim lo'ot shloshim yom lehuladato which is conducted 30 days after the time of his birth. We call it Yeshua haben. Okay? Do we know or do we not know? The mad rabbi of the desert, Simcha Perlmutter, did not put those words in that book. It was put in by some very wise and intelligent rabbis long before Simcha Perlmutter was even a thought. Simcha Perlmutter has only one job. To comfort my people from the midst of the desert. To comfort my people by saying the time has come that we no longer have to fear. We no longer have to fear about telling the truth. We can speak the truth to ourselves. We can speak the truth to our neighbors. We can speak the truth to all on Israel. We can bring it out, not just in the window, but take it outside on the streets. And not worry about these robbers, rapists, and murderers. We can bring it to the light, the beautiful sunshine of Israel. We can bring it to the beautiful flowers of the Galilee. We can bring it to the beautiful sparkling waters of the Kinneret, the Yam Amelach, and of the Salt Sea, which will soon not be the Salt Sea, it will be a very living sea, not a dead sea. We don't have to worry any longer. The prophecies are being fulfilled, and every prophecy was only about one thing, the days of the Mashiach, we've been told. And as we see the rains falling, and as we see the flowers blossoming, and as we see the land coming to life and the people coming to life and the multitude, the mixed multitude of non-Jews coming home with us we can say this is the day that Hashem has spoken of and I can say to you you sat with me now for this long period of time to hear me please look at me and understand that I am not speaking a message of hatred to the Christian world I am also not building a bridge to the Christian world. In all honesty, I am not building a bridge from the Jewish world to the Christian world because there cannot be such a bridge. One is the antithesis of the other. And I'm telling you, the Jewish people back in their land is a prophesied event, now history, and continuing to take place. And non-Jews are coming home with us day by day. Non-Jews are coming into synagogues and they're converting and they're becoming Jewish. Because when you come into the Jewish people, you meet the Messiah. When you come into the Jewish people, you find Him. And you find the true Him. The true One. The One who is the defender of the Jewish people, not the accuser. If you heard me this day, then you know what Simcha Pramara is all about. I am not one who tries to destroy anyone listening to me or watching me. As God is my judge and as He is my witness, I reach out my hand to you, both of them. Jew, I say, come home to your homeland and to your people and to your God, to your nation. And non-Jew, I say to you, come back to the faith of Hashem. Come back to the faith which was handed to Moshe and on down the line in an unbroken chain until every Jew of this day and not the least among them is the one who is being redeemed from the Gentiles this day, Yeshua, whom we will hear for a second time on the mountain 
of the house of Hashem. Din herabi amenu, quickly and speedily in our days. God bless you. Amen.